I'd like to welcome you to Otterbein University and to this year's Science Lecture Series. The Science Lecture Series has been going on for over 35 years now. It was formed by two of our <coughs> former faculty, Dr. Philip Barnhart and Dr. Jerry Jenkins, who got the idea for this. We've been able to fund it through the generosity of George W. and Mildred K. White, who created the White Science Seminar Fund, which has paid for it. And it wouldn't have happened without the faculty and staff of the Science Lecture Series Committee, who have worked many hours this year to put on this event. So I'd like to thank them as well. Over the years, this series has taught us about subjects as diverse as astronomy, quantum mechanics, and behavioral neurobiology. The series enhances our excellent science programs at Otterbein and contributes to campus and community discussions on topics important to our knowledge of the world. We are thrilled tonight to have Dr. Diana Aga here and to continue this tradition. In addition to tonight's talk, she spent the day meeting with students and classes and faculty. She was telling me how great our students are, which we know, but it's good to hear it confirmed by somebody else. Um, and having a number of interesting talks, and she's going to continue that tonight with this public lecture. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bridget Ramos, Associate Professor of Chemistry, who's going to introduce our speaker. Bridget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for our wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming and the wonderful invitation on, and for really arranging a beautiful weather for us to come visit you. It's uh, the, the best 
uh, is to arrange up sunny weather and stay inside. <laughs> um, so let me. Okay. Um, so I noticed that uh, there are a few of you who had been in classes, and I've met you a few times and also in my talk. Uh, so I hope uh, a lot of the slides are here too, but I'm thinking that you came here thinking that there will be free drugs. <laughs> and I will tell you, you will be disappointed because I'm not giving you free drugs. So it's going to be a very disappointing talk <laughs> because the forever chemicals that I promise you that you will have these forever chemicals, I have another bad news. Because at the end of my talk, I will tell you that nothing lasts forever. And that's a good news, for now at least. So at least if you fall asleep with my talk, those are the two things you need to think about, right? There's no free drugs today, but I will show you why my title is that, and that even though there are a lot of forever chemicals, there's promising good news because we will, I will show you that there are some promise. Uh, the government is doing a lot of, uh, funding a lot of grants, funding a lot of research to really remove these forever chemicals, which I will tell you what they are if you don't know, if you haven't heard of them yet, but I'm assuming many of you have heard of this because it's been in the news, in the newspaper, it's been talk of, of many, many uh, radio talks and even comedy shows, so, and it's in the movie, so I'm assuming most of you have heard of it. Uh, so, as mentioned, um, I'm the director of an institute which really also not, not only uh, talk about water pollution and looking for solutions for uh, contaminants, but really about health impacts of, of these chemicals that we find in the environment. Uh, and we're dealing with uh, things that are also relevant to climate change, how we can have uh, clean energy, and also the political issues that are, uh, that are affected by many of these issues. So I, um, it's, while I'm going to talk about my research on water pollution, uh, we, we recognize that it's not the only thing that matters. There's so many other things that, um, that we, we need to deal with in terms of water pollution, climate change, and health impacts. So um, my research, uh, so I'm an analytical chemist, and I know I gave a technical talk today, uh, earlier, and I try not to do a lot of chemicals here, but I can't help it. You're going to see chemical structures, but I will try to explain some of it because I, I don't know how to explain without showing chemicals, so that's a warning. <laughs> uh, but so the things that we look at are many environmental contaminants that um, have been there before and has been banned, and also emerging contaminants that are now showing up in the environment, not because they were just there now, but it's because we are able to detect them. So many of these are called emerging contaminants, such as antibiotics and many other pharmaceuticals, ingredients of personal care products like uh, triclosan from this antibacterial soap. Uh, many of those end up in the environment. Um, hormones and estrogens, and then I will also talk about persistent organic pollutants such as PFAS, or these perfluoroalkyl substances, which are also called forever chemicals. Okay? To do these things, we have to first develop analytical methods to be able to measure them and detect them, um, and to be able to see their occurrence in the environment and their, their fate, whether they stay in water, they are uh, volatilized and uh, transported somewhere. So many of this matter. And, and so in addition to being working as a chemist, I work with many different disciplines like engineers, modelers, uh, epidemiologists, doctors, because in the end, environmental chemistry is very multidisciplinary. So I met a lot of students today uh, interested in this type of uh, research, and many of you have different backgrounds, and we need that. We need microbiologists, we need physicists, we need uh, computational scientists. All those really matter. 
Uh, so it was really nice to talk to a variety of students with different backgrounds. Um, in the end, the end goal is to remove them from the environment, to treat them uh, from wastewater treatment plants so that they don't end up in our drinking water. And to do that, we need the environmental engineers. So I work a lot with many engineers uh, to be able to solve these things. So in this picture, you will see uh, cows because many, I will show you that many of these antibiotics are used in, farm, in farming industry. You will see wastewater treatment plants, these round things. And then uh, you see the fish. I'll show you some of that work. We collect water samples. And then this picture here, uh, with it says um, potential toxins that lurk in blood and breast milk because many of these persistent organic pollutants are fat loving chemicals and breast milk has a lot of fat so they tend to stick in fat and what happens is when a pregnant or a, a nursing mother breastfeed a child these are all offloaded to the child and it affects their brain development it affects their cognitive behavior, and so on. So it's, uh, it's, infants are the most vulnerable. Uh, so it's very important that we actually look at serum from pregnant mother and the breast milk. So a lot of those involve analytical chemistry. Uh, and that's why I get to do a lot of this research, because we have the tools uh, to detect them. The first thing I wanted to focus on is antimicrobial resistance, OK? So, Antimicrobial resistance uh, is one of the most critical challenges of the 21st century, according to the uh, World Health Organization. Um, and it's actually been predicted that 10 million deaths per year will occur from infections by antibiotics that are resistant, uh, or by, by pathogens that are resistant to antibiotics by year 2050. So you will see here, Sorry. Yeah, okay, here. In this uh, estimate, they estimate that about 10 million deaths occurring. That's more than uh, deaths from cancer and diabetes combined. So that, that's a lot of deaths from infection, uh, from pathogenic bacteria that are no longer uh, responding to antibiotics because they become resistant. Uh, and most of them will occur in low-income countries, in Asia and Africa, unfortunately. And most of them do not have the capacity to do the research and the prevention that we have in uh, more developed countries. So one might think, why would we worry about it, right? It's in Asia, we are in America. Well, remember what happened to COVID, right? It started in China and the whole world suffered. So we need to be concerned about this. Um, and just a little trivia here, it's actually shown that when we travel, within a couple of days, we pick up these antibiotic resistance genes from food, from water, from the air that we breathe. And if I highlight it here, because I'm sure you won't be able to see it from that far, but uh, so it's here, um, the prevalence of uh, antibiotic resistance genes uh, towards beta-lactams, these are big uh, antibiotics that are widely used, increases from 9% to 33% within a couple of days when you travel. Uh, here's another one, um, quinoline, so this has, these are like ciprofloxacin types of antibiotics. They also, the resistance genes that you can pick up can increase from 6.6% to 37% within a couple of days. So you become a carrier of these resistance genes. When you come back and then you excrete here, then you put out these antibiotic resistance genes in the environment. So then you carry these resistance genes from wherever you're traveling from to the US. And this is how antibiotic resistance spread. So it is a global issue. But most of the times, the, you will hear about antibiotic resistance in the hospitals. So there's been a lot of research done in clinical settings, but not so much in the environment, when in fact, antibiotic resistance also occur in uh, municipal wastewater, so from our domestic waste, and also from uh, the livestock industry, as you can see in this picture. 
and they all go towards the environment, the wastewater, so manure from livestock, uh, I will show you some pictures here later, they all end up in the environment. So in the environment, there are low levels of antibiotics being introduced. And if you expose microorganisms at these low levels all the time, the, the susceptible bacteria dies and the superbugs proliferate. So that's where the superbugs come in. So you create the superbugs uh, that become resistant to the antibiotics. And therefore, if this is a pathogenic bacteria that infected a person, some of the antibiotics that we have now may not cure you because the bacteria proliferates and survives because they have become superbugs or resistant bacteria. So that, that is a scary thought. Um, so where do these free drugs come from? Two major things, aside from the manufacturer, so I didn't even put here manufacturing companies, but in our cities, uh, the main source is the wastewater treatment plants. So when we flush our toilet, when, so when we take antibiotics or any drugs, not everything is metabolized. Part of it, up to 50%, maybe even 80%, are excreted in urine or feces intact. It's still, micro, it's still biologically active. And wastewater treatment plants are not optimized to treat them. So when they discharge the water, all these res residues of drugs end up in the surface water. And that's where we swim, that's where we take some of our drinking water supplies. So we use it for domestic waste. And with, with the climate change now, where we are running out of clean water and sometimes some cities have drought, we recycle the water. There's, there are more and more cities are doing water reuse, meaning that the water that you flush in your toilet end up in your tap water. So yeah, that's a, that's a thought, right? So all these chemicals can end up in your faucet. The good thing is the utilities are doing something about it. There, many utilities now are aware of this, so they're modifying their treatment system, they're improving them, because nobody wants contaminated water in our own homes. So there's a lot of research done. It's now, actually I'll show you that there are some good news. There are effective ways to do this, to remove these chemicals. But still in the environment, we need to figure out how to stop antimicrobial resistance development. Not only the municipal wastewater, the livestock industry also contribute a lot. Um, so you can see here a picture of manure being spread in the environment because many livestock industries, so here you, you have the statistics, about 10.6 uh, million kilograms, I forgot the million there is, million kilograms of antibiotics are used in livestock industry. So this is about 40% of the antibiotic sale in the US. That's quite a lot. And you see tetracyclines is the biggest uh, class of antibiotics used because tetracyclines is cheap. So you can mass produce it and uh, it's used for treating diseases in animals, but also for growth promotion. Uh, luckily, again, because people have recognized the danger of antimicrobial resistance, the Food and Drug Administration have actually like, made regulation so that we, we no longer are allowed to use antibiotics for growth promotion. But in the earlier days, many people put uh, antibiotics in their feed to, to feed the animals to, to raise them quickly with less food. So that's. And you can see here some other chemicals that are also antibiotics that are also used in human treatment, like uh, penicillin, so we use that also. So whatever resistant bacteria that may develop in the farm will be the same resistant bacteria that will infect humans. So there is a war against superbugs. There's many people doing things about it. The medicinal chemists are trying to see whether they can develop new drugs that will not have resistant or not develop resistance. The engineers are trying to treat the water to make sure there's no residues. And uh, health practitioners are trying to see what we can do to, um, uh, to clarify this, this uh, environment free of drugs. Okay? One of the things is re regulation. In many low-income countries, so I'm, I'm from the Philippines, I know that we can still go to the drugstore and buy antibiotics without prescription. And also many people don't know that if your doctor tell you 
to take drugs, the antibiotics for two weeks, even if you feel better in the first week, you have to take all the other medications because if you stop on the seventh day and don't continue the second week, you just kill the susceptible bacteria and the, the superbugs are still left in your body. So now you are harboring the superbugs. So you need to take the rest of your medication to kill the rest of the superbugs pathogens. Um, and the, other, the other thing is when people don't finish their drugs or medications, I don't know if people do that still because now there's a lot of education happening, but before when I started working on this, I know that people would just flush their extra drugs or expired drugs in the toilet. That's how they, they dispose them. You're supposed to take them to the drugstore or they're now collecting collection centers or put it in incineration. You're not supposed to flush it in the toilet because if you do, it'll just go to the, waste, uh, to the wastewater treatment plant and to the environment. So there's, these are little things that I hope, uh, if you didn't know yet, after my talk, you should stop flushing expired drugs in your toilet. So, because, uh, so the animal industry now, uh, there's probably one of the problems that, um, about these superbugs or resistant bacteria. There's, uh, you, I, you could see here, uh, in China, India, and Brazil, and Kenya, they are the hotspots of, uh, of antibiotic resistance because, uh, and I know this because I've, I have collaborations in these countries, I found out that some of the farmers actually spike their feed, uh, including aquaculture. So they, they put sulfonamides, antibiotics in their feed, and they spray in the, in the aquaculture to prevent the spread of diseases in fish. But then you're putting antibiotics in the water. And same thing for chickens. Uh, I have a, a slide here, uh, something from Bangladesh where uh, we detected ciprofloxacin, which is one of the strong antibiotics that are used when there is no lo longer an effective drug. We detect them in their groundwater because I found out that they put a, a medicated feed for their chicken so that the chicken are healthy. So because I mentioned this is a global issue, uh, part of the things uh, one of our work is actually collaborating with many different countries here from Switzerland to Sweden, of course US, and then from, from Asia, as because I mentioned many of these antibiotic resistance will occur in Asia. And here we send our students to collect water samples to measure antimicrobial residues, antibiotic resistance genes, the bacteria itself, and then many other things that may create the superbugs as you as before and after water wastewater treatment because wastewater treatment plants are hot spots for these uh, super drug, super bugs and all these chemicals. So we, we look at this uh, problem to see how we can help low income countries uh, in terms of like low cost treatment. Uh, so because analysis of this is not cheap, as you can see here, I put here. Having the right tools in conducting research is really important. And many of these problems we didn't know about many years ago when I was doing my PhD several years ago, we, this was not an issue because we thought that water was clean. And that's because we couldn't detect any of these compounds because the technology wasn't there. But now we have all these advanced technologies that can detect them. Uh, but these are not cheap instrumentation, so this does, these are not readily available in countries like the Philippines or India or, or other low-income countries. So we try to make this collaboration by sending our students, and it's also good, so National Science Foundation funds this. Um, the idea also is to help our American students see what's out in the world, because sometimes we are trying to solve all these problems, but we don't really see the real problem. So we, we, we get a lot of international students coming to the US, but the, our students don't have the opportunity to go out a lot. So this is a good opportunity for our students to, to go. Um, not advancing. I'm not sure why it didn't advance. But it's stuck. 
I'm going to escape it and it's stuck. Okay. Sorry. Technical problem. Here we go. See it. Ah, okay. So, to do that, we train local students from all these collaborating countries on how to collect water samples, how to pre pre prepare them. Uh, and because it's so difficult to send water samples internationally, uh, there's problems of breaking samples, cost, and maybe being stuck in the customs. We put them in these cartridges, and this is what we ship. So we ship them in dried amount or dried materials, and, and we train them to do all this process. This, I put it here just to show you that just to prepare a sample, it takes a couple of days. Uh, so we, we train them how to do this, and, and then uh, our students from here, they work with the students in the local universities in the collaborating countries, collecting samples. You can see here, this is a water sampling in Manila, and you can see many of these big cities are highly polluted. Uh, this is from India. You can also see, and, and there we do the microbiological analysis. Uh, so there's a lot of cross-training, so it's a good experience for students as well. Uh, this is in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very tiny island with high-rising buildings, so all the wastewater treatment is all in a very small area with highly populated people, uh, city. Switzerland, you can see it's an advanced country, and it's very obvious their water system is very clean. Uh, I lived in Switzerland for a couple of years, and they swear you could drink the surface water without treatment. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Bangladesh. Another polluted countries where, country where we, uh, we have seen a lot of the misuse of antibiotics. Okay. So here we train them. Uh, we ship the samples, these cartridges, to the U.S., and we analyze them. We analyze them for many, many chemicals from different uh, drug classes, sulfonamides. You might be familiar with tetracyclines, macrolides penicillins, and so on. And then, not only we analyze them for antibiotics, but we also analyze them for antidepressants. We analyze them for antidepressants and other chemicals because we have learned from other research groups that even non-antibiotics actually play a role in the development of antimicrobial resistance because they also put pressure on the bacteria. And when the bacteria has a lot of pressure, whether it's thermal, chemical, they want to survive, so they, they, they release all these genes and some, some of the other bacteria will pick it up. So that is how they transfer the bacteria. So I want to show you some data just to give you an idea of how different the concentrations are of the antibiotics in developed countries like Sweden and Switzerland. And I just want you to see the x-axis here. So here it's 500. 4,000, that's like the highest. It's nanogram per liter. And I also want you to see the influent. So that's before treatment. And you can see the yellow one are quinolines. So there's a lot of antibiotics going into the treatment system. But in Switzerland, the effluent, when it comes out, it's clean. See, it's all, not, it's all below detection limit. You can also see in the downstream, it's all very clean, right? So you can see that in Switzerland, the water is, is very clean. So I think it was, that's why they can brag about their surface water. You can drink it uh, very clean. Uh, in some countries, even Sweden, which is also uh, pretty advanced, even their treatment system doesn't remove all the chemicals. And I will tell you why, how the Switzerland surface water is very clean. There are some things you can do, and they do that. They spend a lot of money in their water treatment. But even here, you can see the influent. Is, this is how much comes in, and this is how much comes out. So they're still untreated. In the green one, that's our, those are my macrolides, so penicillins and so on. OK. One thing I want to show you. So, so remember, that's 504,000. Now we go to India and in China and Hong Kong. Um, this is like 65,000. This is how much higher the antibiotics residues in their surface water are. That's a lot higher. Um, and here it's 50,000. And one thing interesting here that I also want to point out, so the upstream, that's the surface water 
before they discharge the treated water. So there shouldn't be anything there, right? Because that's, bef so it's, it's like a river. Um, we collect in where they discharge and we, we collect where the river is flowing. So that's the, the downstream. So in the upstream, they shouldn't have any antibiotics there, but there is, and that's because of the chemical manufacturing companies. Uh, may, as, as you may know, many of the drugs here in the US, we, uh, many, many um, chemical companies, they uh, import the active ingredient from India or from other Asian countries. And the regulations there are not so good about cleaning water. So that's why there's a lot of contamination in the environment, hence, Many of the superbugs that we see now, most of them have originated from uh, Asian and African countries. Okay, this is something interesting. I wanted to point it here. So this is from Bangladesh. That point there, that's from their own drinking water. So in many of these uh, countries, they have their own well. It's not like us here where we have distribution systems. There they typically pump their own drinking water. And you can see there is a, two to 10 nanogram per liter of ciprofloxacin. It's an antibiotic that is reserved for infections that are not treated by other antibiotics. So that's kind of scary, right? You're running out of effective antibiotics. And, and so that's why it needs to be addressed. Something I've shown this earlier, these are antidepressants. So the bigger the circle, the more concentrated, and then this is detection frequency, so it's like how many times, how many samples have antidepressants. You can see that in the US, it has the highest concentration in the most frequently detected versus, for example, in the Philippines, we didn't detect anything, or in India, there's very little. So not only low, low number of detection, but also low concentrations. Uh, so there's kind of a correlation between like, ad, uh, I guess, advanced or well-developed countries, low. so CHE stands for Switzerland uh, in Sweden, so there's that kind of interesting fact. Hence, it's not surprising that in some of our work, we detected antidepressants in the Great Lakes, in the Niagara River, and it concentrates in the fish brain. So I was talking to some people here, okay, so why should we really worry about it? The fish are happy, they're not depressed, you know, it's all good, right? It's all good. But not really, because if you think about it, uh, some of the things we, we have seen, so we do have some also lab studies uh, where we actually feed some fish with known amount of antidepressants. We observed that the, the swimming behavior change, they don't recognize predator, so they might be just like eaten by predators and some of their species might collapse. Uh, they also are not interested in mating anymore because they're happy, right? So there could be collapse in the population. So ecologically, there may be some long-term effects, okay? Um, so we might not think about those little things, but it is important in the biodiversity. So yeah, it, this is actually um, a work that has gotten a lot of attention because we would never think about antidepressants get, getting into the fish brain. Now, in some cultures, so like I talked to some of the students earlier, so in Asia, in some culture, I think Africa also, we actually eat the fish brain. So maybe that's why there's no antidepressants in the Philippines, because we've been eating fish brain. <laughs> I never thought about it. Okay, so what about other contaminants? I promise you there will be other contaminants, and this is about forever chemicals. So forever chemicals, it just happened that, so forever chemicals, are uh, made up of a lot of carbon where the hydrogen has been replaced with fluorine. It just happened that chlorine-fluorine bond is the strongest covalent chemical bond. And that is why the bacteria have a hard time degrading them. So they have actually called them, so it's a tongue twister, it's per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So you could say, you could hear them as PFAS you could also call them forever chemicals, which just happened to be also the FC bond. So that's kind of what just happened. But I also want to differentiate that what is per polyfluoro alkyl substance and poly. So the difference is that per all the 
carbons uh, contain fluorine, okay? So there's no hydrogen. The poly, some of them have hydrogen. And it will matter because I will show you later that this, when it has the hydrogen, can actually be degraded by bacteria. And also I want to, to tell you that there, while I only show you here five PFAS, there are more than 12,000 different PFAS. And the reason is when they manufacture this, the process is such that it creates so many different isomers, so many different forms, so many, and to purify them, it will cost a lot of money. So they just use the mixture. So there are things that we may be able to do. And of course, there are important uses of these chemicals. So we cannot just say, just ban the whole chemicals. Because in our society, we do need chemicals. So it's not the solution to just like ban everything, okay? There, are, there may be some things we can do to still benefit from the specific use, but not have that bad effect. So if you didn't know what PFAS are from, they are everywhere. They're in automotive, uh, they're in aviation, they are used for cable and wiring. They're used for firefighting uh, materials, this foam to suppress fire. They are in your nonstick cooking ware. They are in your pizza boxes. So you know when that pizza grease is like leaking from the greasy pizza and you don't want your cardboard to be soaking, they put that lining and it prevents the oil from dripping. So these chemicals have a very interesting property. They are both water repellent and grease repellent. And it's not normally like that. Normally chemicals are either water loving or oil loving. But this one love both water and, and oil. So that's why it became so useful. So where are they? They are in your raincoat from Colombia, Northwest Patagonia, all those expensive stuff. Because we, want, we don't wanna be wet. So they are water resistant, water repellent. But the thing is, with sunshine and washing and water, a lot of those are removed. So our washing water gets into the wastewater, so they're in the wastewater. And they accumulate in the biosolids, uh, that solid that kind of settles, and we have to dispose those solids. And those biosolids typically are land applied because they are a good source of fertilizer. So there's the PFAS there in the farming where actually the corn we grow. So they, we have seen that some corn, some plants take them up and can distribute them to the food that we eat. So it goes back to our food system. So check out the products. Things, the thing is, they are not required to put this contained PFAS, but some, chem, some companies are now, are, now, are, are now labeling their products. So check those out. Um, and I put there the website in case you're interested to see if some of your consumer products have PFAS. <clears throat> I mentioned cooking, cooking ware. They are in your nonstick pots and pans. Uh, so what can we do? I mean, you can use cast iron. You can use stainless steel and ceramic so they don't contain PFAS. And if you can avoid, a lot of the food packaging use this material. Uh, so here are the products with some of the brand names that they declare or we know we found out have PFAS. And again, a lot of these materials, those waste, get, ends up in the, in the uh, landfill where they can, de they can degrade some of them, or they, not degrade, but they leach from the materials and they end up in our water. So you can see in this picture um, that. So things to do, you can consider maybe reducing fast food. Some of these companies are now trying to find alternatives. Uh, you, can, you shouldn't be microwaving things like this because the, the more heat they would leach off. So some of the things you can, again, I put here a website with, which lists all this uh, food, packag food packaging that contains PFAS. So I put here two, two of the 12,000 PFAS because they are the ones that are most uh, measured, most detected in the blood. So 98% of Americans have PFAS in their blood. We all have it. 
most of us. Uh, PFOS, so it's PFOS. And the difference between the two is this head group. So this is, has sulfur, this has carbon. So PFOS and PFOA are now um, regulated in some state and the EPA is proposing now to regulate them in the drinking water. It's still a proposal, it hasn't been approved. Um, but the thing is, so these are very chemically stable and thermally stable, resistant to biotic degradation and so on. But you can see where they're coming from. Uh, drinking water is one of the big source. They affect mostly, especially the vulnerable, the infant, the unborn children, and so on. Um, so they are actually everywhere, including the rain. You would think that the rain had evaporated, it's the most pure water because it's now condenses. It is contaminated also with some of the short chain volatile PFAS. So uh, lakes, rivers, the aquatic organisms. I, could, I showed here the sewage sludge that are placed in our agriculture. So even the bottled water, you don't be fooled that the bottled water could be the most clean. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them we have detected PFAS, and uh, some research on the, have detected PFAS in human blood, liver, brain, and so on. And there are many effects now that have been associated with these chemicals, including um, lower birth, obesity, puberty, uh, early puberty, low sperm count, kidney cancer, and so on and so forth. One of the things that are new is this uh, reduced response to vaccine. They found out that when the people that had they, they didn't respond so well with the COVID vaccine. Turns out some of the, them have high levels of PFAS in their blood. So people are researching this now, like how come uh, PFAS is decreasing the effectivity of, of uh, vaccines. So because of all these health effects, these two compounds have been banned in the production in 2016. And they've been replaced with short chain and less fluorinated compounds that they think would be less toxic uh, and less persistent. And so they are called emerging PFAS. These are the chemicals. I mentioned to apologize that I have to show it because I want to point out the difference. They put oxygen here, here, and they made them shorter chain. Uh, for chemists, you might know or remember, I hope, that you remember when, whenever you have an ether, this oxygen, it's easily broken. It, it can be biodegradable, so they become more biodegradable. They also change a little bit. There's chlorine now, so chlorine and carbon are more biodegradable relatively compared to chlorine fluor. So they're doing this little chemical modification to make them more environmentally friendly. But they found out they're just as toxic. So you can see there's actually, and they're just as persistent. Many of these are showing this, this GenX showing in their surface water. It was in 2018. They're detecting any of all this like surface water. They're seeing these chemicals that they replaced PFOS and PFOA. So, and I wanna show here that these are broken by bacteria, but the end product are still persistent. So they are still PFAS. So it's still fluorinated and they still persist in the environment. And the, the sad news is actually this shorter chain are more water soluble. So they actually don't get absorbed quickly in or more effectively in carbon. So you, you know your filters, the filters are good in capturing many of these chemicals for drinking water. But when you have a shorter chain, they actually absorb some, but then over time, they don't absorb anymore. And they are the first one that come off. Uh, so they have become labeled regrettable substitute because they're just as bad, they're just as problematic. Now this is like history repeats itself. There is, this is not the first time regrettable substitute uh, came about. You might remember DDT. DDT is an insecticide back in the 1970s that had been used to kill malaria carrying uh, mosquitoes but they were, turned out, they were very carcinogenic. They have reduced the eagles and wildlife because they end up having these uh, eggs, uh, having really thin shells. So, so it was banned in 1972 and they substituted 
with methoxychlor. And you can see, even if you're not a chemist, you can see the difference. It's very similar, but they put, again, that, that oxygen to make it biodegradable. And it is more biodegradable. The half-life is only one to three months. But in the end, they found out it's also carcinogenic. So they also banned it, okay? Another example of a regrettable sub... Oh, sorry, I have one more. So the, I wanted to put it here because, interestingly, even though DDT was banned in 1972, that's like more than 50 years ago, we are still seeing them in the eggs from the Great Lakes. So this is one of my students who graduated a couple years ago. He collected some of these abandoned eggs, and we measured them for pesticide, chemicals, we found DDT in these eggs. So that means the sediments from the Great Lakes still have DDT, and the fish that eat them, that are eaten by the birds, that lay eggs, so they transfer this, uh, it's still there. So in a way, DDT is also called, should also be called forever chemicals. Another regrettable substitute. You might be familiar with PCB, polychlorinated biphenyls. Again, this is big benzene ring with chlorine, very stable. They use a lot in a lot of many use, industrial use. They have half-life of 10 to 15 years. They've been banned production in 1979. Some of them were replaced by PBDE, so as a flame retardant polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Again, they put this oxygen to make them biodegradable. So they are more biodegradable, but they are also regrettable substitute because it turned out they're also bad for the children. They have actually endocrine disrupting properties. They affected uh, mental development, cognition, and all this affecting the, the children. So they banned it too. So this is a constant thing. Um, we found out they also bioaccumulate in the fish that the higher in the trophic level have more PBDEs and they, ha they do just like the transfer to eggs, we also transfer it to our kids through breast milk. This is a depressing talk, isn't it? <laughs> I'm depressed. Is there any good news? I want you to go home and feel good about my talk. So I'll give you some good news, okay? You're ready for good news, right? Yes. <laughs> the good news is you can drink your water. Uh, because, and, and the good news, let's start here. The good news is nothing lasts forever, except maybe diamond. Uh, we have found some bacteria. We have isolated some bacteria from the wastewater treatment plants that can potentially degrade them. We're doing it in the lab, so don't, it's not the end of the story yet. We're still in the lab phase. We want to make sure that it goes to the environment and it's full scale. But at least we found some bacteria that degrade them, and they do it by shortening the chemicals. So you can see here, now from eight carbon to four carbon, but our goal is to make them into water and CO2 and everything goes, right? That's the, that's the end goal. But we need the analytical chemistry to show that it happens. So, and to do this, when we treat forever chemicals, um, the thing is, we found out that the bacteria actually can only degrade the, the poly, the one that has carbon that has no fluorine. So if you have that, they can biodegrade. So the goal is how do we get to that from fully fluorinated, how do we get to this? Because the bacteria doesn't do it. So we found these nanomaterials. I work with material scientists, uh, graphene oxide. It does the job. It, it removes the fluorine. And after that, we feed them to bacteria. So it's a nano-bio degradation. It's funded by the Nation National Institute of Health in collaboration with microbiologists, engineers, uh, and us, the analytical chemists. So we can design it so that we can hopefully degrade it all the way to the end. And we can show it, actually, with analytical chemistry that, for now, that chemicals keep shortening, shortening, and we have found these chemicals now, it even, again, even if you're not chemist, you see there's no fluorine there. And acetate, that's like acetic acid, that's like in your vinegar, so it's not dangerous. Formate acid, and then we can show that analytically, that that's the end product. So that's the good news, there's hope, okay? 
And also some good news, the levels, and this is not my work, I got it from the, from the uh, a report, that the levels of PFOS and PFOA in human serum in the US is decreasing. So that's also good news. Uh, but that's, that's to see about what, what the other chemicals are. So back then, this is like in the early 2000, you could see that the regulation of chemicals, when they ban the chemical, you can see the level in the serum. Uh, no, this is a breast milk. So this is DDT when it was banned. The level of DDT decreased in the uh, breast milk. But then it was, uh, you can see the increase in the PBDE in the breast milk because PCB was replaced. So PCB decreased and then PBDE increased because that was the substitute. But then it was banned, so now you can see a decrease also. So it mirrors the levels in our blood, okay? Another good news, um, even though biological treatment as the conventional activated sludge treatment does not remove many of these pharmaceuticals, if you use activated carbon uh, in ozonation, you can actually remove many of this, 95% you can remove. So that's good news. Uh, Unfortunately, having the ozonation is very expensive, but that's actually in Switzerland, most cities have ozonation, it's very effective, and they are willing to pay the price to make their water clean. Uh, so that's something we can think about if are we willing to, wait, to pay the price to get the clean water. But what about those that are not able to you know, upgrade their treatment system? What about those antidepressants that are not degraded? I have to find a silver lining well, they said that it's good because the fish in Canada have better access to antidepressants. Um, that was a newspaper from Can Canadian uh, newspaper when they saw my article. Uh, because in Canada, they don't dispense uh, antidepressants very easily, unlike here. You have to like convince your insurance that you need it. Uh, so it's not easily accessible. So they are jealous of the fish that can have that. So to end my talk, I just want to have a few things about when, back when I was an undergrad, my environmental chemistry professor taught us, this was long, long, long time ago, okay, that dilution is the solution to pollution. If that's the case, why are we seeing antidepressants in the Great Lakes, in the fish? So I don't think that's the truth. It should be education is the solution to pollution. So I want you to think about this, and we are doing that. We, uh, some of our research actually translate. We, we go to the K-12 to in high school. We're doing, uh, we, we are involving the young people now to, make, to be aware of, of this thing. So we have uh, this network of uh, our graduate students go to the K-12 to and, and teach them concepts of chemistry and environmental chemistry. And so I'm hoping that with this talk, you can take home some of this message, take, tell them to your siblings or mothers and relatives about this so they can be aware not to dispose all this packaging from, uh, from food waste. Uh, and because antimicrobial resistance remain an issue, uh, there's still an ongoing funding from Food and Drug Administration, Agriculture, food, uh, USDA, and EPA. And we are working with different disciplines to understand uh, that in the lab how bacteria uh, pick up these genes, and in the agriculture, how the wastewater treatment plant contributes, and so on. And now we're doing this metagenomics, all these advanced tools to be able to understand uh, how antibiotics spread, uh, antibiotic resistance spread, so we can have a solution. So with that, I would like to thank all the students that have done all this work. I just have the privilege to present them, but really all the students that work in my lab are the one responsible for all these results. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you for the question. If I understand the first question is, if the water filters we use at home are effective? Is that the first question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, actually, uh, and I'm not connected to any of those companies, so I'm not trying to sell it, but yes, they are very effective. Uh, uh, the, th the only thing is like you need to know when to change it. So some of them, they have this indicator to change it, but they're very effective. I use my, uh, some, uh, I use at home, and also uh, sometimes I use the filter, but I, I, they are very effective. Good thing. The second question, the manufacturers, they do recognize that they are responsible for many of this and there's a lot of lawsuit actually. So, and they have been funding some of the research uh, being done by some, some uh, uh, researchers to develop methods to remove them, to study health effects. So they do, they have been giving funding and also paying some tremendous amount of money for the damages that they have made. Yeah. Um, kind of a follow up to that. Um, you said they're funding its removal. Are they funding like adequate replacements for these? Mm. Going to be forever chemical? Yes, a good question. Um, I'm not sure about if they're funding replacement, but I know there are they're funding like in general research to find substitute, but it's not specifically for this. Like they want to be general, but there are some material scientists or, or organic chemists, polymer chemists, who are looking for substitute for this. Uh, it's gonna be a long haul because, uh, so in Europe, they just wanna ban it, like just not use it at all. Uh, but then there are some people who are like, we do need it for some things, okay? So in, in fact, one of the things, and you might not know about this, uh, some, so we are trying to push clean energy, right? And one of the things is hydrogen energy. To transport hydrogen energy in the pipes, you need these polymers to make the piping not brittle. So you need PFAS. So it's kind of like, if we're trying to push clean energy and we're trying to ban PFAS, how are we gonna transport hydrogen? So there are some uses that really need this. But yes, we do need some replacement that are, uh, environmentally friendly, <laughs> yeah. It seems like there's a lot of uh, microbiology involved in the work for you. Do you have any background in that yourself, or is that something you exclusively collaborate with other scientists? I don't have background in microbiology. I like to be friends with them. <laughs> They're very good friends of mine. And they do, we need a lot of the microbiology. So once we identify the bacteria, we actually need to look at their genes, their genomics, because in the end, maybe we can uh, enhance the bacterial consortium in the wastewater, if that's allowed. So there are, there are a lot of things that the microbiologist will have to do. Good question. I never thought about it, but um, I don't know. Yeah. So you mean like uh, the, the 
non-depressed or the depressed happy fish will affect invasive species? Uh, that's a good question. I will ask my biology friend. <laughs> Yeah. Um, are there ways that we can, as an individual, help protect ourselves? Mm. Yeah, I often, okay, so that's a good question I, because I also think about that, like, right? Am I willing to give up my pizza? Yes, I can deal with that. But there are things, so first, when you're buying coffee, instead of using those disposable cups that are lined with PFAS, maybe you can use your own cup and buy coffee using reusable cups so we, don't, we have less waste. I think, in general, our society is wasteful. I can see that. Uh, I've lived in many different countries. I he I've been here more than 30 years, I think. And in general, and I am guilty that, about that too, I, I tend to use disposable because it's convenient. So now I'm very, very, I, changed my, my attitude. I now try to not use disposable plates, no disposable cups. I, uh, when I microwave my things, I, I don't microwave them in the package they came in. I put them in ceramic bowl. So those are things you can protect yourself. And the water filter, uh, it works. But I, I have one under my sink. It, it, it works, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Would you eat fish, walleye, from Liberia? <sighs> if I'm really hungry, <laughs> I wouldn't eat walleye from like yeah. yeah. I'll take well, you know I'll take it back. If it's caught near the shore, I wouldn't eat it. But like my brother actually goes. Uh, boat in, in the middle of Lake Erie, so it's deeper, I would eat it. Yeah, I would eat it because it's, there it's very dilute and the, the wastewater treatment plant discharges are more on the edges. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, and I still eat fish from the market and I just don't know where they're coming from. <laughs> You know, I agree with you, actually. Uh, so I mentioned, I, when I lived in Switzerland, everything is so expensive. The vegetables are so expensive. The hamburger is very expensive. Then I learned that in Switzerland, the farmers do not use pesticides. So the government subsidizes them to produce so they don't lose money. So it's the taxpayers' money. Uh, they pay the farmers to farm without pesticides, so they produce less but the amount, the cost is expensive when they sell it. So they have a very clean environment. So yeah, that, I think that's a good solution. I'm just not sure uh, how the society will accept that. It's a mental change. Can you repeat that, please? Um, for like any, if there's any medical solutions for me, like I, I, to any solutions to transferring these um, medical to Yeah, so and, uh, the answer is no. Yeah, there's no like, you can't take medicine to, there's no medicine to say I'm gonna reduce the 
chemicals in the breast milk. So that, unfortunately, there's no medicine for that. The only thing they can do is they say, if you're planning to be a mother, uh, try to avoid all this food, uh, so prepare for it. Uh, and maybe, I, I don't know how easy it is, if, if you're really concerned about breast milk, maybe you could get it tested, and if it's really high, then maybe you should not breast milk. But there's a lot of benefits in, so there's always this argument, right? There's a lot of benefits for breast milk, uh, for breastfeeding, the nutrients, the antibodies, and all that. So there's always this argument, like, which one is better? Not having the immune system that you can give to your child because you're not breastfeeding or giving them the chemicals. So it's a really difficult decision. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good point because I know that there are now a lot of uh, take back medicine uh, centers like Walgreens does it. Uh, some of the grocery stores in Buffalo, we have this uh, uh, Wegman, they have a monthly take back. But, but if you're not allowed to carry them to that, I don't know how you would do that. But I did hear that when they have waste, like uh, solid waste from like cut litter, they incinerate the waste. So if you incinerate them, then they are degraded. Uh, I think it's the best way rather than putting them in a toilet because in a toilet it's in the water. So I think it would be okay because if it's true that all the waste that they take up from our household are incinerated, then everything is okay. Yeah, thank you. Blame the chemists. <laughs> um, it's it's hard, you know, because um, so we know to be to, to have this water repellent and oil repellent, we need that long chain that looks like a surfactant. So when when manufacturing companies make chemicals, they have in mind the purpose of the chemical. They don't think about what will happen to the chemical when you don't use it anymore and you put it in the waste. It's not part of the money making. So in, in, in industry, when they assess their product, they always do assessment, like, can we make profit? So they don't think about the end life of the chemicals. But nowadays, I think there's a lot of push. There's a lot of research now, and maybe more people are educated that maybe when we do make chemicals, when the chemists make chemicals, uh, we should think about that aspect as well. Like, if I have this really good product that kills the malaria-carrying mosquito, will, what will it do to the environment? And there are many different things about the chemical you can tweak and maybe make it better, but still. So, so the thing about PFAS is I mentioned there's like 12,000 chemicals, and it's because the production of it is electrochemical. It just makes a lot of these different isomers different forms, and then they use it. They don't purify it, because to purify it will be very expensive. So, but maybe if they purify it and just take the product that you use, or the other thing is for, for organic chemists, for polymer chemists, maybe they can design 
a way to make only that one chemical that you need so you don't create all the other byproducts that pollute the environment. So I think there is a possibility to create such a thing, just more work and more thinking and more education. Yeah. Good questions. Um, there's a lot of like, talk I feel like recently about like endocrine disrupting things and carcinogens and like self care products like made up of like each shower products. So how important would you say it would be to try to switch to better versions of those? Some of the endocrine disrupting chemicals from the personal care products? Yeah, you know, it's hard because some of those fragrance stuff. Uh, maybe you can switch to non-fragrant, no, yeah. It's, it's hard to switch, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort. Like, maybe you don't need the antibacterial soap, uh, because the triclosan, it's a chemical that they put in the antibacterial toothpaste, and the bacterial soap, they're very uh, uh, persistent in the environment. And actually, I, and I didn't even put it here, so triclosan, if they, during the disinfection or during the treatment, sometimes they form dioxin, which is carcinogenic. So maybe, maybe we should remove some of these chemicals that are not necessary in our products. Um, or maybe we should stop buying things that has that, you know, triclosan or antibacterial things. Yeah, and uh, that's the thing, I like looking at this website, you could start looking at products that doesn't have PFAS. Yeah, but, but sometimes it's tricky because some of the drinking things that we have here, which says BPO free, BPA free. Well, it's a BPA, so it's still have that chemical, they just modified it. So it's a little tricky to, to change. Um, sorry, the antidepressants? I didn't, sorry, didn't quite get the question. Maybe I misspoke or maybe you un misunderstood what I said, but um, so what I meant is uh, now that, so Antidepressants have a lot of this uh, chlorine and hydrophobic, so they tend to bioaccumulate. But that's because they, that's the way they bind to the receptors. So, as I mentioned, when manufacturers, when medical companies make those, they don't have, they don't think about doing a more biodegradable chemical. So maybe I misspoke or maybe you misheard me. So I didn't mean that companies are now trying to make more biodegradable antidepressants. Uh, what can be done though is maybe to relate to the medical practitioners to really think about do we really need to prescribe a lot of these medicines? Or if you think about it, if we are only absorbing 50% of the chemicals and we are excreting the rest. So do we need to take 500 milligrams of the chemical if 50% of this is, the, is, maybe it's part of the pharmacokinetics, but I often wonder if we are overprescribed by medications. Um, yeah, that's, but I'm not a doctor, so I may not know anything about pharmacokinetics. But yeah, that's what I mean, it's like, Something to think about. Earlier you mentioned that it's reckless in the whole is not in the 98% of the population. How has the 2% of the population managed to avoid the mm. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so I have a, to answer that, I'll just give you a, a, a true story. In my lab, I have a Sri Lankan student, and she was trying to de determine a method 
to analyze serum, uh, PFAS in serum, and she couldn't find a blank sample because when you, do when you do methods development, you always need a blank to show that what you're detecting is true. It's not just contamination, so you need to show that your method can see blank. We couldn't find anyone with, without PFAS. When she volunteered to get her blood taken, she has no PFAS, and then she asked another friend, also from Sri Lanka, no PFAS. It's like, okay, you guys are the chosen ones. <laughs> and then she said, you know, Dr. Aga, when we grew up, because she's just been in the US for two, three years, we use clay pots for cooking, and we don't eat a lot of this uh, package, you know, uh, McDonald's, they're mostly vegetarian. Uh, so that could be that. Uh, and because she lived in a rural area, so non, not a lot of these disposable cups, and they don't wear these coats, you know, that are water repellent, they use umbrella. So a lot of the simple things in life could actually save you, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just also want to thank you, everyone, all those thought-provoking questions. You know, I, I really enjoyed my visit, and I hope that when you go home, there's something that you learn from my talk, because as I say, education is the solution to pollution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. I hope it's okay. <laughs>